you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to being cremated because it's my last chance at a smoking hot body. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. The other one was. Yeah, about the apocalypse. Oh. Or Who cares if I don't know what the word is? Apocalypse is not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I am not unhappy whatsoever. In fact, I am very happy about being able to pass away. I just wanted to ask, um, how, are you guys in here until 2.30? No, probably until about 4. Okay, perfect. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, life in a nursing home. Uh, I will tell you this, that the people in this nursing home are some of the kindest, nicest people I've ever seen in my entire life, and they do impossible tasks for impossible people like me uh, under impossible situations, and they should be awarded a God's Medal of Honor for the work they do. And uh, so anyway, I am here, and uh, let me tell you how I got here. I was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota during the war, 1944. My dad was in St. Louis. He was in intelligence and he was in the spy guys and he was he dealt with prisoners of war, German prisoners of war who were sent here to work in on farms as slave labor. My mom and my grandma raised me from 1944 to 45 when my dad got out. My sister, who was two years older than me, Gail, had an incurable diet. Oh, we got the goods. Where's your guitars? <laughs> no. Yes. Seriously? Yes. This has got the picks. That's the band. Oh, the the picks, picks are in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then you can leave this guitar. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, the other yeah. guitar is back there. Yeah. Oh, right. right. That's fine. I can use it. We, we now have every instrument we have. No. No. Yes. There's one more instrument. Oh. Okay. okay. Yeah. I. <laughs> and they, they all. And after I pass away, they all belong to you guys. Okay. Oh, you have to do that. Yeah. So. Uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota is about three hours uh, north of Minneapolis-St. Paul, and it's very cold. And uh, Judy Garland was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And, and the people, the powers that be in Grand Rapids up until the 1970s did not want anybody to know that Judy Garland had been born in Grand Rapids because she did not live a lifestyle, according to them, of the sanctified streets of Grand Rapids. Then a young lady moved to Grand Rapids and opened up a one-person, one-room museum and proceeded to defeat the entire establishment. And now there's a Judy Garland festival every year, and Liza Minnelli, the other daughter, has come up to perform, and it's a really big thing now. Well, I grew up outside of a suburb, outside of St. Paul, Minnesota, called White Bear Lake, and I grew up on a lake and it was a good time, and I was raised Presbyterian. And the one thing I used to ask Presbyterians was, why was my sister born blind, born deaf, totally deaf? And then when I was eight years old, she was 10 years old, we found out that she was going blind, retinitis pigmentosis, called tunnel vision. And my strong Russian dad uh, from northeast Minneapolis, I saw him cry like a baby when they came home from the Mayo Clinic and found this out. So I asked my mom what we should do about this, and she said, all we can do is pray. So years went by, and I used to ask Presbyterian preachers, why was my sister born deaf and, why, and going blind, and why was I so lucky? Now this especially meant something to me because I considered her to be a superior person to me. I could just tell she was more evolved than me and was just a really, really good human being. And not that I was a bad human being, but I just considered her superior to me. Well, time went on and there was a faith healer, a Christian faith healer in St. Paul, whose name was Ed Jennings. And Ed 
own the St. Paul Fenson Iron Works. He was a down-to-earth type of guy, and he was on his deathbed in St. Joe's Hospital in downtown St. Paul, and he was in a coma. And then suddenly, he was looking down at his body, and this is the way he told me the story. He was looking down at his body, and he, a, a voice said, Ed, you are not the body, you are a spirit. And Ed was shortly awakened thereafter and miraculously healed and walked out of the hospital. And the medical establishment said that it was a, a case of a uh, misdiagnosis. So Ed became a faith healer, sort of by default and by accident. People, he had a prayer group and people would come to him and, and Ed told me this. He said, Sam, I would pray for many, many people and nothing would happen. And then one particular person would come in and the Holy Spirit would move and bang, that person would be miraculously healed, just like you read about in the Bible. And he said, it didn't make any sense to me. Now, Ed owned this business where he worked with his hands and was just a down-to-earth basic guy. So one time he accidentally ran into Bob Raymer, who we'll talk about later, who had the Yogananda SRF Center in Minneapolis. And Bob went over there and read the autobiography of the yogi and realized there was a lot more to the story than what the Christian church was saying. So he also really appreciated the merging of Christianity and Hinduism that Master did. So I was about 16 and I went to one of these faith healing groups with my mom and sister. And Ed uh, gave my mom a copy of the autobiography of the yogi and then she gave it to me and I read it and bang, that was it. That was my Bible for the rest of my life. And I just loved that book, and I devoured it. And then I understood why, you know, people incarnated in different ways. It had to do with karma, and reincarnation, destiny, growth, plans, and everything. So I now knew why. But the next thing I was reading about was Nirvikalpa Samadhi and meditation. So I started meditating. And I was meditating. I, I meditated, I'd say, three, four days a week, and nothing happened. I was like a stone wall. I was getting no mystical experiences. I was feeling nothing. So I thought to myself, duh, I need uh, to find a real yogi master. So I arranged a scholarship to spend my junior year at the University of Benares, the holy city of India. And I got the scholarship, and I was all set to go. It was end of May 1964 and I had my passport, my visa, I had my shots and I went to see Ed. Now I had told all my buddies from high school and college, they said why are you going to India? And I said I'm going to India to find a real yogi master. In 1964 they universally thought me totally daft. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I uh, and I told my girlfriend that and she jilted me cold so uh, Ed Jennings he said why are you going to India and I said I'm going there to find a real yogi master he said you know he said I probably should have told you about this I apologize there is a real yogi master in Milwaukee Wisconsin I said Milwaukee and he said Known for beer and baseball. So I, I said, I, I said uh, what's his name? And he said, his name is Dr. George. Does he have a last name? Does he have a phone number, address? I said, how do you know he's real? He said, my wife had a terminal illness. And in 1958, I took the train down to Milwaukee and I asked Dr. George to pray for her. And George made me sit there, and we meditated for two hours, and he touched me on the forehead right here, and he said, your wife will be whole. And he got on the air, on the train, and on, on the way back, he told me, Ed told me that every time he closed his eyes, 
he saw a white cross in front of his spiritual eye. Ed was very Christian. So his wife was healed. So I said, that's it for me. So I left St. Paul at about 8 o'clock in the evening, and I drove all the way to Milwaukee, about 350 miles. And I, is that okay? Great. I, I drove to Milwaukee and I got in about six in the morning. I remember I went to this restaurant on 84th Street and, and I-94 and I had breakfast. And then I went to the payphone and I started making phone calls to see if I could find somebody. They called Dr. George. And about the eighth or ninth phone call, I looked in the phone book. There was a spiritual teacher whose name was uh, Joel Goldsmith and he wrote a book called A Parenthesis in Eternity and he was a beautiful uh, spiritual teacher. The master actually gave him a, a place in uh, Encinitas where he could go stay anytime he wanted. The master blessed him. Now I had gotten to see Joel Goldsmith down in Chicago with my sister in April of 1964, took the train down there, and we stayed at the uh, Hilton there, and Joel Goldsmith's presentation was at the Hilton, and I went to a black bellhop, and I gave him 10 bucks, and I asked him what Joel Goldsmith's room number was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, went up, and I had a book to read, and I sat there outside his room, and people walked by and I paid them no attention, just kept reading my book. And finally, Joel Goldsmith himself and a few people came up and he looked at me quizzically and I said, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. I just need to ask you one question. Are you my guru? He looked at me and he said, very, very kindly, he said, no, I'm not. And his eyes kind of gleamed. And I thought, bless you. And so this was now end of May and I uh, was in Milwaukee and and uh, I happened to see in the Milwaukee phone book, Joel Goldsmith's group was called the Infinite Way. There was a telephone number for the Infinite Way. So I called that number and this woman named Mrs. Mickey Kowanda answered, and I remained friends with her for years. And Mrs. Kowanda at that time was probably in her 60s. And uh, she was a great lady and she was a student of Joel Goldsmith. And I asked her, I said, do you know a man named Dr. George? And she said, yes, I do. And she said, I'm gonna give you the number of his assistant, Jerry Neal, and you better call him now because he might be leaving town. So I called Jerry Neal at that number, and Jerry answered and said, hello. And I said, this is Sam Padani, I'm from St. Paul, I'm here to see Dr. George. He said, boy, you just made it. We were just walking out the door. <laughs> I'm going to be gone until Saturday on a business trip. So I said, well, how can I see Dr. George? And he said, I just had breakfast with him, and he left Milwaukee, and he's driving to our, our church retreat in Friendship, Wisconsin, and that's where he's going to come to. So he gave me directions to Friendship, Wisconsin, and the church retreat, on Brown Deer Avenue and how to go north on Highway 13 of Friendship and take the right on Brown Deer Avenue and there on the first right would be our compound. So I drove and I drove and I, uh, I got up there and I rolled into, uh, rolled in there and I, I looked around, there's nobody, no people, no nothing and there were some very strange buildings <laughs> I looked at these buildings and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck? And I thought, this has got to be a place. So nobody was there. So I thought, well, I'm going to drive back down to Friendship, Wisconsin and get a bite to eat. So I drove back down to Friendship, Wisconsin. And I had the last hamburger I had on this earth. So uh, I then drove back out to see if anybody had come. It was only 10 miles. No. So I, there was a kind of a, a park, and I went down there to that park, and I was learning the folk song, 
Four Strong Winds, which is one of Don and I, my favorite songs. And the, the, the singer, I don't know if you know the singer, famous singer Neil Young. When Neil Young grew up in Winnipeg, he used to, uh, there was a Calgary, uh, and, uh, and this song Four Strong Winds was written by a guy named Ian Tyson, a cowboy around in Western Alberta. And Ian Tyson, uh, excuse me, and uh, uh, Neil Young used to go to this uh, kind of resort store that had a jukebox and he spent all of his money playing Four Strong Winds over and over and over. And he learned the song when he was a kid. And Don and I learned the song a long time ago. All of us loved that song. So I was picking my guitar, learning that song, memorizing the words, and also picking out melodies and stuff. And then every couple hours, I drive up uh, north, uh, which is only about five miles now, to see if anybody had showed up. And there's still nobody had shown up. Well, by this time, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 o'clock, and there was a big geological formation called Rabbit Rock. And I climbed up on top of Rabbit Rock, and I was watching the beautiful uh, sun setting down in the west slowly, and I was watching and keeping an eye on Round Deer Avenue just in case somebody took a right-hand turn there. And all about 6 o'clock, here came this big old green pickup truck, light green pickup truck, filled with stuff and a big full trailer filled with a huge big uh, sewer main uh, uh, main tour tu 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 tunnel uh, or something so he was going about 20 miles 25 miles an hour and he took a right on Brown Deer Avenue I thought well that's got to be it so I went down got in my car and I pulled, pulled in and there he was and he had gotten out of his truck, and I came up and I said, are you the one that they call Dr. George? He said, yes I am. He said, come help me move this thing. So I got it in the truck and we went down, went down far into the place. I saw a whole bunch of more wild buildings. And uh, so he and I, with with all kinds of this is and that's and whatnot. I mean, I, to this day, I don't know how we got that thing off of there, but we moved that big old thing off of there and he said, come on. And so then he said, help me take off this trailer. So we took off the trailer and parked it. Then we got back in the truck and went down. And he said, uh, you look hungry. Uh, I'll cook you some food. And then as he started to cook, all of a sudden he stopped. And he looked at me. And he looked at me like this, like this, like this. And he said, Master said, you're supposed to be vegetarian. But he said, you need to eat fish at least once or twice a week. And he said, so I'm cooking you some fish. And he cooked me fish sticks and peas and rice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a meal. And then I uh, I helped him wash the dishes. And I, he, I forget what he did. He went and did something. But I was sitting in the living room there, which was kind of like the sanctuary. And they had the master's picture up there, and Jesus' picture and you know, whatnot. And so I was sitting in the chair. And then he came in and sat in his chair. And he didn't say anything, he just sat down and he said, you know, he did our invocation, you know, Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ, did our invocation. And then, and then we, and we started meditating. And that was the first time I felt it. I felt it. And then Dr. George walked by me and patted me on the head and walked upstairs. And he said, you sleep on your bed in there. There's, there's a bedroom right off of there. And he said, sleep in there. So I meditated for, oh, it's so nice. Ah, oh, I slept on a dead log. The next morning I came out and uh, he said, we'll go to town. He said, uh, do you like coffee? I said, yes. So uh, he said, uh, but, uh, Dr. George, I said, I would like you to be my teacher. And he said, no, he said, you need to go to India to find a real yogi master. <laughs> so I said, no, I want to stay with you. And then he, then he started pointing out my flaws. Oi, oi, vey. No, I had so many flaws. And then he started pointing out, he said, you were a soldier. Well, many, many times. He said, you have a lot of karma to work on. And, he, and so I kept arguing with him. Then finally, I'll never forget this.
He had been smiling, and his eyes gleamed, and he said, put his hand on my shoulder, he said, don't worry. He said, Master sent you. He said, I will help you. <laughs> it was the best thing I ever heard in my whole life. So, I, uh, we went out and had coffee, and I we drove back to the, to the farm, and I, drove back to Minnesota and I packed up everything I owned and I moved to Milwaukee. And I was the day that I ran into Dr. George. So uh, Dr. George told me, he said, uh, you have Jerry Neal's number. Now, how he knew that I had Jerry Neal's number, that was all thank you. That was just another little thing that I didn't even think about until later. But there was no way he knew that I, I didn't tell him I knew Jerry Neal's number. Jerry didn't call him and tell him I knew. So he said, you have Jerry Neal's number. He said, you call him and I'll tell Jerry, you, you come to Milwaukee and you stay with Jerry. So <laughs> I, I drove, uh, first I drove by the University of Minnesota where they had this program. And I resigned my scholarship and the guy was all upset and he said, Listen, I said, there, there's only 20 people who got this. There was a ton of people who were backups. I said, you're not going to have any trouble filling this scholarship. He said, yeah, you're right. So anyway, uh, I drove to Milwaukee, and I found Jerry's place, and I saw it met Jerry and Irma, and uh, Jerry was is, a, was is a great, great, great soul. And he was one of Dr. He was Dr. George's assistant. Now, if you want to talk about hilarious and irony, here is this real rugged guy named Jerry Neal who played football at Nebraska and was in the Navy and had biceps this big and had Navy anchors tattooed on both biceps. <laughs> and he was working in Chicago, and, it, and he had a wife and uh, three kids, young kids, and uh, he had found a used copy of the autobiography of a yogi at a used bookstore, read it. The day he finished reading it, you tell me how this could happen, he got a postcard, one of those old three-cent postcards, written in pencil, come and see me. I, I need your help. Dr. George, SRF, 5000 South 20th Street. So Jerry, that uh, as soon as he had time off, drove up to Milwaukee and found, uh, what, what time is it? Oh, we're good, Sam, not even 2.15. No, we're good. Quarter after two. That okay. was the code for the restroom. All right. So we, um, Jerry drove up to, uh, found this 5000 South 20th Street, looked around, and said he had never seen such a colossal, unbelievable, crazy building in his whole life. And Dr. George came out and said, Jerry, he said, I'm glad you came. He said, I need your help. And so he put Jerry to work right away, and they had to, they were doing something uh, around there, uh, working away physically like a son of a gun. And uh, so then Jerry, he says, uh, you come to church, he said, and come uh, bring your wife. And he said, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, so he, uh, George did not have a telephone number since, until the 1970s, okay? And uh, so Jerry, became Dr. George's assistant. And now Jerry had grown up in a town called Zion, Illinois. Zion, Illinois is between Kenosha, Wisconsin and Milwaukee and Chicago. It's, and it's a, was a religious community. It was an evangelical community. And they had evangelists that went all over the world. And at one time they had the largest wood building in the world. I'll see if I can find that on the internet and send it over to you. And Jerry's dad had been an evangelist for 
the top guy who was the main evangelist. Jerry was born in England, where his dad was doing evangelizing. And when Jerry met Irma and got married, Jerry said to Irma, Irma, there's one thing you can count on. I'll never be a preacher. I've had my fill of all that, baloney. So, Dr. George <laughs> says to Jerry, I want you to be a minister, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you will take the sun service this Sunday. Now, let me describe the church to you. The church had, uh, you know, wood, leaky roof. I mean, when it rained, the water just flowed through there. They had a dirt floor. The pews were logs, which Jerry and Dr. Jordan had helped split with, a, with one of those power saws, you know, the ones that go like this. And Jerry went and bought uh, rugs and towels and stuff to be able to put on the chair so people didn't get splinters while they were sitting on them during the service. <laughs> and uh, so Jerry told, Dr. George told Jerry, he said, Jerry, this is the meter service, and you play this record to begin, then you do this, and then you play this record, and this and meditation, and then you finish up with this record and long meditation. So Jerry did the service the way Dr. George wanted, and after Dr. George came up and said, Jerry, you did a very good job, uh, except for one thing. Next week, maybe you should plug in the record player. <laughs> Yogi Nanda did stuff like that. Sai Baba did stuff like that. They all did, okay? So uh, the record player played with no electricity. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Jerry uh, then moved to Milwaukee and uh, was with Dr. George up until the time uh, Jerry passed away. Uh, let me see. Probably old guy, I think Jerry passed away, I'm just a guess. And uh, he was a very, very good soul, and very advanced, and he also had a real unique view on things. And Jerry and I always had one thing that we could sort of bounce off against each other, which was understanding the meaning of Dr. George, which wasn't so easy, because Dr. George didn't write books like Master, and he didn't. Uh, you know, he, he was you know, mostly a silent saint. And he did give a long talk on Tuesday night after we held, we, we held a service, and then downstairs in the church in Milwaukee, he gave a talk. Now, I will tell you something. When Dr. George gave that talk, most of the stuff, I'm there. I'm very devotional. He's my guru. I'm mostly listening. <laughs> then all of a sudden, bang. One thing just hit me. That was for me. And everybody in the church felt the same way. I'm telling you, every person in our church I talked to felt exactly the same way. That one thing in that talk was for them. And so, anyway, I uh, worked construction. I had gone to college for two years. Now my sister moved down to Milwaukee. Oh, let me tell you about my sister. My sister went to this private school for the deaf in Fairville, Minnesota, about an hour south of Minneapolis. And she learned how to talk, and also she learned how to read lips. When you spoke to her, she read lips. And so she was very smart. She went to school with hearing kids and got straight A's. So she had gone to college out of Huron, South Dakota, but her vision was getting worse and worse, and uh, she had to come home. And she just didn't want to stay at home by being, you know, living with her parents. And I had moved to Milwaukee, so about a month, well, Gail, when she was at that private school for the deaf, used to tell my mother and I, I could just see her telling us, she said, sometimes when I'm very lonesome at night, when everybody's asleep, this kind man stands at the end of my bed and talks to me. That just puzzled me. You know, I, I didn't get it. So my mother says, Shh, just don't say anything about it. So we, I was there for about, uh oh, something happened there. Uh -oh. 
so, something, uh, uh, my, my mom, after I had been there about a month, my mother and my sister Gail drove from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, down to Milwaukee to just to check me out. And so they went to the church service on Sunday morning, and they, uh, as we were standing by my mother's car, Gail walked across the street, and she pointed to Dr. George, and she said to my mother and I, she said, that's the man, the man who had spoken to her at night when she was lonesome. And so Gail wanted, wanted to get permission to move to Milwaukee, so Dr. George said yes, and uh, George suggested to my dad that he help me buy a house. So I bought a house across the street. I wasn't 21 yet. So I bought a house across the street from the church. My dad co-signed. And it was an older house, had three bedrooms, and had kind of two bedrooms, and then a, a bedroom had a built arm over this direction out the back. And had a big yard. And so I worked construction for a couple of years. I worked sewer and water construction. And here's another little wrinkle of Dr. George. I, As I had moved there and was just kind of getting settled, I said to him, I said, what would be your advice as what I should do? And I was thinking college or you know, whatever. And he said, Grange Construction is hiring. He then looked up in the air and said that. So I, I looked in the phone book and Grange Construction Company was a couple blocks this way, a few blocks that way, and right over here. So I drove over and came into the office, and here were these two large ladies up front, and they looked at me and I said, I'm here to see if I can get a job. They said, how'd you know? I said, how'd I know what? She said, we just got the bid about 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. The bid which doubled the size of the company, meaning they were going to be hired. So George happened to pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked construction, sewer and water construction, for a couple of years. About, well, maybe about a year and a half. And at first, you know, it was very, very difficult, but I realized this is what Dr. George wanted me to do, so I was going to do it. And uh, I don't need to go into it, but it was a really hard kind of in into in initiation. It was very hard on me. And I had grown up in, you know, middle class White Bear Lake and uh, straight A student. And now I was working with guys who were half of them were prison guys. And, and uh, the foreman was 6'5, 230. And he called you by your first name of profanity that came out of his mouth. And, mm -hmm. and so I, the first thing I thought, I, well, what I better do is start sending love to him. So I started sending love to him. Then I started sending love to all the guys, you know, around there. And then one by one by one, it's like they all wanted to be friends with me. Strangest thing. <laughs> this one guy had two guns in his trucks, his dump truck, and I was the only guy who would went in his dump dump truck. And he wanted I me mean, always to come and have lunch with him. So I had lunch with him in his dump truck and his guns. And uh, he was a hard guy. And then uh, uh, Don uh, Don the foreman. Every, whenever he had a chance, if we had to drive out someplace and get a piece of equipment or deliver a piece of equipment for another job, he would have me get in the pickup truck with him and uh, or drive another truck and whatnot. So I rode with him through all these things. And he talked to me and talked to me and talked to me about his wife living in California, how uh, he was so sad that he, he can't, couldn't see his kids and whatnot. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I can imagine <laughs> being married to him. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, and just about the time I was really getting into this, I think here what here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, you know, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get a kind of civil engineering uh, degree, and I'm going to get into this, you know, construction business. And just that time, uh, I got laid off. Hey, I was gone just like that. So then I thought, well, I better go back to school. So I went back to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and I also got a job as a, as a, a computer operator. So I operated, operated a computer from midnight to eight, and I went to school full time during the day. And then Gail and I went up to the farm every weekend. 
And uh, so life went on. And on February 2nd, 1967, early in the morning, my boss called me and told me that some men were coming to pick me up and I should shut the computer off. So I shut off the computer and two Milwaukee City cops came and they took me out to their car. They didn't say a word. I sat in the back and I said, where are we going? And they wouldn't answer me. And we went south. And then as we exited on the road, which went to my house, I thought, geez, we're going to my house. And sure enough, we went up my street and there were fire trucks all over the place and my house had burned down and Gail had passed away in the fire. And she was in that side of the house over here, which didn't actually burn, but the oxygen was deprived and so she was sound asleep and passed away. Now, a couple days later, I went to stay with Jerry, and a couple days later, the captain and lieutenant from the Milwaukee City Fire Department came out and they did a really kind favor to me. They showed me and Jerry with all the building plans and everything about where the fire started, how it started. It was electrical fire and it started actually right under my bedroom. Mm. So if I had been there, I would have gone, they told me I would have gone just like that. So already I had been thinking, geez, if I had been there, I would have been able to help her. Well, not a prayer. So I'm thankful those guys. Well, then uh, I finished up my education and uh, I was working as a systems analyst trainee, and then I hit the road uh, playing music. And so I played music for many, many years. And uh, I played the Holiday Inn Circuit. Then I did uh, programs for schools called the History of American Folk Music. Don and I played folk music, and that's our real unique, we love folk music. We, uh, so, And then I got married in 1978 to a woman out of Kansas City who I had met. She was working on her master's at a school in Kansas where I had performed. And now she was working on her doctorate up at the University of Kansas. And so uh, I was meditating and it was, it was uh, 1978. About the, about the end of May, it was Friday night, and Dr. George came to me very clearly. And I had kind of known that it was his time to go. So I had known, I could, I could feel that it was his time to go. He came to me and he said, come and see me on Monday. So I had a gig, a private party on Saturday night. And I worked that. Then I flew to Milwaukee from Kansas City on Monday morning. And I told Bill and Haley Haynes out of Michigan, who was up at the Song and Morning Ranch for many years, he was a disciple of Bob Ramos. And a bunch, a whole bunch of other people who knew Dr. George around the country. And there was about five or six of us who flew in on Monday. And we hung out with Dr. George on Monday and Tuesday. It was so much fun. And he was so jovial. We just had a wonderful, wonderful time with him. And he was uh, insulting us. He was all kinds of trouble. And then on Tuesday, he said, okay, he said, you boys, he said, can go, go back. And he came up to me and he said, straight up, and he rarely, rarely gave orders or commands, very rarely. He came up to me and he said, I want you to move back to Minnesota and start a center in Minnesota. So I said, okay. So that's what I did. I moved back to Minnesota, 
and uh, Kathy, when she got her doctorate, moved up and we lived in Minnesota and she helped me and I started a center. And it got, we got about 30, 40, 50 people and it was good size for many, many years. And uh, I, well, I mostly played music and talked about Dr. George. And then I also talked to Ron Sai Baba because he had come into my life through these guys in LA. I'll tell you my first Sai Baba miracle. I, when I, I fell in love one time, and when I woke up with this lady, uh, it was very difficult. I, I just was still thinking about her, you know, a year later. And so this actress, whose name was, uh, I don't know, and uh, she, she was an actress out of Los Angeles, and I was going with her. And I was much more in love with her than she was with me. And she found me out on the, the beach, the Banga Canyon Beach. And she, she'd been trying to get a hold of me. I'd been traveling playing music. And she said that she was jilting me and she was moving back to St. Louis, Minnesota, St. Louis, Missouri, and going to marry her old high school flight. And her name was, look, I can't remember her name, but let's, let's, let's say, Patty. Patty. Pat, it was Pat, Pat, Pat St. James. And so uh, she uh, left and I sat there on the, on the ocean. I think I told you this one. So I sat there on the ocean and looking out at the ocean and a, she was red-haired, Pat St. James from St. Louis, Missouri. And down from PCH came this red-headed woman and threw her blanket not much further than you, right? And she looked over at me and I looked over at her and pretty soon we were talking. Next thing you know, we were really talking. Then I find out that she had come out from St. Louis to get married, and this guy had dumped her at the altar, and she was thinking about going out into the ocean and committing suicide. And I said, so we talked and talked and talked, and we went and got something to eat. She had no money or anything, so I, I, I stayed on my couch, and she stayed in my bedroom and uh, for the night, and then uh, next day, uh, she we, we drove. I took her out for a drive. We're on a great drive. She called her mom and dad, and uh, so the following day they wired her money and uh, they got her a plane ticket. So she, I took her back to the LA airport, and she we were singing as you know songs on in my stereo as we were driving and. She was saying, I don't know what this trip you're into, I'm a Lutheran, but she says, I really believe God sent you to me.